um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a chapter called Coming to Your Senses. And I want to just sort of share with you where I'm trying to go there. We all know the human body has senses. How many? Five. Some people claim they have a sixth sense. We'll get to that in a moment. But the five we know and love, a sight, uh, uh, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. Thank you. A couple of these are not very useful when you're studying the universe, like taste. You know, your, your, your tongue doesn't reach the cosmos. So the tongue is not very useful. Neither is your sense of touch. Uh, but sight is certainly very useful. No doubt about it. And <coughs> excuse me, I'm nursing a chest cold from a few weeks ago, so forgive me. We got our five senses. And then there's some people who say they have a sixth sense. They can know things that your five senses can't. And you say, well, what might that be? They can maybe feel like they know the future, or they know when someone's looking at them, or they know they feel it somehow. Turns out, turns out, anytime you bring that person into a controlled laboratory, those talents just go away. They just don't exist. They're missing in the laboratory. So either it is an actual talent that just somehow hates laboratories, or there's sort of a delusional thing where you think you have the power, but in fact you don't, and you're remembering the hits and not the misses. Like you pick up the phone, you say, Grandma, I knew that, I knew that was going to be you. Okay, well, if it wasn't her, you wouldn't say, oh, I thought this was going to be my grandma. You just don't even say that because you kind of look bad. And so you forget the misses, you remember the hits, and you, there's this self-selection going. Psychologists have known about this forever. It's, it's, we, we dupe ourselves into thinking we are more powerful and more brilliant and deeper and more insightful than we actually are. Maybe it's an ego-preserving feature of what it is to be human. But by the time this, our session together is over, I hope to disavow you of those great feelings you might have of ourselves as a species. Um, so, it turns out, in science, we have dozens of senses. There's plenty of things you might want to know about, but you can't, because you're limited to your five senses. For example, right now you have no clue and no way to measure, without a device, what is the level of the magnetic field in this room. No clue. If you could measure magnetic field, you could think of that as another sense. Measure the magnetic fields around you. We have no idea. We are not equipped for that. Neither can we measure, for example, the presence of ionizing radiation. Well, you would eventually know this <laughs> because like your limbs would fall off and you say, hey, something happened. Okay. <clears throat> You'd be sterile, well, that'd be, take a little longer to figure out. Um, you know, you, we have no capacity to measure this. Other things, you don't, oh, other things. You don't know, um, there's some obscure things like polarization. You can't detect the polarization of light and that light has, vibrates in two different directions. And you can polarize it so it only vibrates in one direction. You can devise glasses that can polarize light, but you still wouldn't know the difference. You don't know. We, we have, it's a big deal in, in astrophysics whether light is polarized or not. That tells us where light is coming from and what its points of origins are. But another sort of everyday thing you just can't figure out. Um, one of them is you can't detect low-level earth tremors. Why? Because you have like shock absorbers in your knees. And so your knees sort of get rid of it. You have filters against it, but you put up a seismograph, and there it is. There it is. So, so we, I can go on and on and on and on and on. But perhaps the most important sense we don't have is the ability to see outside of the spectrum of visible light. You know visible light, Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, indigo violet. You, it's a Biv there, B-I-V. Now where'd the indigo come from? Isaac Newton, who first labeled the colors of the spectrum, ha had this mystical fascination with the numeral seven, the number seven. And so when he went to label the colors of the spectrum and got six, he said, we need seven somewhere in there. So there's indigo. You got it. We're stuck with indigo. Now, if you have enough precision to put in indigo, there are ten other colors we could have given you in this full continuum of, of, this, of spectral light. Any color-sensitive people could rattle off 30 colors in there. 
But no, we got seven, and Roy G. Biv was born. Okay. If you go beyond the V, beyond V, you get what? Ultraviolet. We, can't, we have no way to detect ultraviolet. Actually, that's not completely true. You can detect it in a time delay sense. Okay? So, depending on what shade of skin color you have, you go out to the beach and lay under the sun. If you are not protected, you're laying there, that fine, blah, blah, blah. and then how, how many hours later you look like a lobster? Okay, so there's a delay there. It's the ultraviolet that made you look like a lobster, but you didn't know it at the time. At the time. So by the time you figured it out, it was too late. Let's go to the other side of red. You get infrared. Can't see that either. You can, we do have infrared sensors. We sense infrared in the form of heat. That's what we call heat when we feel infrared. But beyond infrared, there's microwaves. We have no microwave detector. Well, now we do because we all carry around cell phones. These are microwave detectors. But if, we were, if, eyes, if our eyes were sensitive to microwaves, tune it in, tune in the microwaves, all your cell phones would be ablaze with light. Okay? We'd all be walking down the street, you know, and you'd know who was on, had a phone call and who didn't. Okay? If we had microwave detectors, the microwave towers would be ablaze in broad daylight and in the middle of the night. We have no such detectors. Radio waves, we can't detect radio waves. X-rays, gamma rays. This is the full sweep of the electromagnetic spectrum. And in astrophysics, we have telescopes and detectors in each one of these bands far beyond what your naked eye can detect. And so every day, every night of every day, the astrophysicist is invoking a full suite of senses that brings us that much closer to the universe. Because if you only observe the night sky with a visible light telescope, expressions of our own eyeballs, you'd be missing what black holes are doing in their environment. They're dining, they're flaying stars. The, 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 the outer gas layers of stars as it descends, spirals and descends down to this abyss. It radiates ultraviolet and x-rays. So the first x-ray telescope, the first x-ray telescope, the first thing it discovered in the universe was a black hole candidate. SCO X1, Scorpius X1. Then there was another one in the constellation Cygnus, called a Cygnus X1. These were sources of x-rays we were previously blind to. Turns out, black hole. Right there, black hole. So you can't claim to know the universe unless you look in as many different ways as, and invoke as many different senses as you possibly can. Now, there's a point to all of this. The point is, until about the turn of the century, not our century, but the 1800s to the 1900s, until then, it was possible to say, to do an experiment and say to yourself, that makes sense, or that doesn't make sense, and you had a good chance of being accurate in your assessment. Come the 20th century, where telescopes started getting seriously big, where atom smashers started breaking apart atoms, probing nature on levels and on scales, never previously accessible to our senses. Now, what does it mean for something to make sense? For something to make sense, what that means is, I take, if I take this bottle of water and I let go of it, what will happen to it? It will fall. In fact, so linked is my act of letting go to the fact of this falling in our minds that all you have to do is say to me, drop it. And that means let go. But suppose you lived in a world where 30% of the time, when you let go, this went and floated to the ceiling. 30% of the time. And so only 70% of the time it fell. Well then, common sense would mean something different under those conditions. What was common is 30% of the time the thing floats up. So the word drop wouldn't even exist. Oh. <laughs> Someone gasped over in the corner here. It would be, let go and let's see what happens. You know, people be taking bets. You know, people bet on all kinds of things. <clears throat> so what happens is we break the atom, get inside, get into the nucleus, and a whole new world of physics opens up to us, the world of quantum mechanics, where the laws are different. 
we discover, we, Edwin Hubble, discovers that our, our galaxy is not alone among galaxies in the universe. A great discovery of the 1920s going on simultaneously while quantum mechanics was being discovered, the science of the small. And not only that, he discovers that the galaxies are hurling away from each other. He discovers the expanding universe. A few years later, the Big Bang theory of the universe advances with not much data but that we're expanding at the time. You turn the clock back, you find that the whole universe, sometime in the past, all occupied the same volume at the same time. You say, that doesn't make sense. How could the whole universe fit on the head of a pin? That doesn't make sense. And then you realize the universe doesn't care about your senses because we're probing it beyond the range that your senses were formulated. Your, our senses emerge from being born an ordinary human being in this world, breathing air, walking in one G's worth of gravity. That is our life. And so in modern science, we no longer require that a successful idea make sense. And I think that's created quite a bit of confusion when a scientist says, oh, well, the whole universe was this, and a particle pops out of existence here and shows up there, and there's 11 dimensions, and this. And you hear them say, is he, is, what's he smoking? You know, you wonder what's going on with the scientists today. And the fact is, our regime is no longer grounded in the limitations of the five senses we carry with us. And so the lesson there, and what, you, what comes across in that chapter is my goal, is that it, before you celebrate the brilliance of our five senses, think about what it is you're not seeing about the universe, and then ask yourself, what do you need to know about that in order to claim that you know the universe to begin with? And that's coming to your senses. <laughs> uh, another one, the knowledge of nature. I'm talking about the vagabonds of the solar system. In there, there's like Pluto shows up, but I don't, I'm done with Pluto, okay? So let's leave Pluto alone for a night. I think it, you know, it's got to get over having been Plutoed. Uh, you know, that was the word of the year. Did you see that? To be Plutoed? Plutoed. So was Pluto Plutoed? Or was Pluto something else which had to happen and then everything else is Plutoed after, thereafter? I'm just, we gotta get top linguist on this, all right? Get a full report on that in the morning. <laughs>